Hi, I'm Peter J. Ray. Welcome to Adventures in History. Today's topic is Abraham Lincoln, Part 19, Death at Ford's Theater, Washington, D.C. We stopped last time in April of 1865, uh, Confederate General Robert E. Lee had surrendered, and uh, the other Confederate generals were following suit. So the Civil War was coming to to to, to the end, and the Union had won, was going to win the war, and the Southern states would be restored to the Union. So this was all very good that the Civil War was ending. President Lincoln, however, was discouraged by the hatred and vindic- vindictiveness among some Republicans who wanted to punish the South. He did not want to do that. April 14th uh, was Good Friday, and there was a play at Ford's Theater in Washington, D.C. called um, Our American Cousin. In the afternoon, President Lincoln and his wife, Mary, went for a carriage ride, and during that ride he said to Mary, quote, We must both be more cheerful in the future. Between the war and the loss of our darling Willie, we we have both been very miserable. President Lincoln was looking forward to to, uh, his uh, leaving the White House eventually after his second term. He wanted to visit Europe and Jerusalem, the Holy Land, California. And they decided, uh, Abraham and his President Lincoln, his wife Mary, decided to attend to go to this uh, play, Our American Cousin, at Ford's Theater that Friday evening. And they arrived late at the play. There was a flag-draped box. They were on the second floor at a box seats. And uh, uh, the, uh, the play was stopped when it was realized that the president had arrived. They, they interrupted the play. The audience cheered. Uh, and the pra- play proceeded. In the third act, a famous actor named John Wilkes Booth was able to enter the box uh, from the rear. He had a Derringer pistol. And he held the pistol uh, six inches from the back of President Lincoln's head and fired a shot into the head of President Lincoln. Uh, President Lincoln was in a rocking chair. He slumped forward. Uh, Booth jumped on the stage, apparently broke his leg in jumping, and and reportedly said, Sic semper tyrannis, which is Latin for thus ever to tyrants. And then he fled. President Lincoln's uh, body was carried across the street to the home of William Peterson, a tailor. The wound was fatal. Uh, it was felt it was too hard; it would be too hard to bring him back to the White House or to a hospital. And President Lincoln was placed on a bed which was too short for him, so he was diagonal on the bed. And throughout the night, visitors came. Uh, at 7.22 in the morning, President Lincoln died. And he was uh, another casualty from the Civil War. Uh, The country, uh, there was national grief for the loss of this very good man. And he was really needed. You know, he was needed during the war to win the war. And he was really needed uh, to heal the country after the war. However, he was gone. And then there was a long, eventually a long train ride to Springfield, Illinois, uh, with uh, with the slogan, With malice towards none, with charity for all. Now, during the uh, play, there was a bodyguard guarding the box the president, uh, for President Lincoln named John Parker. He left his post during the play to have a drink in a nearby bar. He was never prosecuted for that uh, uh, dereliction of duty. Uh, another thing, supposedly, or some believe, uh, John Wilkes Booth, when he jumped on the stage, said, The South shall be free. Uh, now, at the same time uh, that this happened, uh, President Lincoln was shot and was dying. And the Secretary of State Seward, who was at, at home recovering from a broken jaw, he was in bed. He was very badly in bad shape. And a, a man came into, the, one of the conspirators came into that his house and uh, tried to kill him as well. And he, was, he barely survived because uh, he had a contraption on his, on his head because of his broken neck. However, he... Uh, he was, here. this poor guy was uh, badly wounded, or uh, hurt already, and then he was wounded very badly. But he, d- he did survive. Now, back at, the, uh, at President Lincoln's deathbed, reportedly after he died, his, the Secretary of War, Edwin Stanton, said, quote, Now he belongs to the ages. Regarding the death of President Lincoln, David Belsiger and Charles E. Sellier, Jr., historians, wrote, quote, 
A few minutes later, those who had watched Abraham Lincoln die were startled to see that the sad, melancholy face had changed. About his mouth was a faintly happy expression. The man who had loved to tell a joke but had carried a burden seemed to be almost smiling. Now, apparently, John Wilkes Booth, who, like others, had studied ancient history and knew the story of uh, the death of Julius Caesar, who Americans at that time considered a a tyrant for ending uh, Roman democracy and becoming a dictator. Uh, And he was uh, one of his assassins when Caesar died was Brutus. And apparently Brutus was considered a hero. And Booth thought that he would be a hero for what he, whom, whom he believed was a greater killing, a greater tyrant. And Pre- President Lincoln, he, who he considered a tyrant. Now, six semper tyrannis, this uh, thus uh, ever to tyrants, that's also Virginia's state motto. Now, uh, Booth did live to find out that he was not considered a hero in North or South because the South, folks in the South knew that this was bad for them because they, you know, they knew Lincoln was a kind man. He'd been the enemy, but they, they also knew that he did not want a hard uh, peace. He didn't want to be hard on the South after the war. As we said earlier, uh, Secretary of State Seward's life was saved by a metal contraction, contraption holding his jaw together that deflect, deflected the knife and protected his jugular vein. Historian Stephen B. Oates wrote, quote, As if civil war had not been atonement enough, for the first time in the history of the Republic, a president had been assassinated and the haunting echo of John Wilkes Booth's Derringer troubled Americans in all corners of the Union. Yeah, so this was terrible. You know, there were, folks were celebrating the end of the war in the North, and and then this, the death of this very good man, their their leader. And in the South, again, they they were not celebrating the the death of President Lincoln. That same night, April 14th, uh, Abraham and and Mary's uh, younger son, Tad, had gone with his tutor to see the play Aladdin at Grover's Theater at the same time. Historian Doris Kearns Goodwin wrote about the death of President Abraham Lincoln, quote, Almost no one was able to conceal his grief that night, for as one witness observed, there was not a soul there that did not love the president. In the death of President Lincoln, the South had lost a friend. The Confederates understood that President Lincoln's death was a loss for the South. And uh, this, you know, increased the anger in the North against the South because uh, it was considered a, you know, an action by a Southern sympathizer. General Ulysses S. Grant said, quote, Abraham Lincoln was inclined to be kind and magnanimous, and his death at this time is an irreparable loss to the South which now needs so much both his tenderness and magnanimity. So a terribly tragic loss. Uh, Secretary of State Seward, who was, was ill and injured and, and, and was not told about the death of President Lincoln. They thought it would be too hard on him. However, from his window, he could see that the War Department, the flag was ha- at half-mast. And, he, and, and, sec- and uh, Secretary Seward said, quote, The president is dead. He also believed that, you know, since he had been hurt, you know, hurt in the accident and then wounded, that President Lincoln, if he was alive, would have visited him. So tears coursed down his gashed cheeks. He had lost. His good friend was dead. In April of 1865, Nathan Bedford, Bedford Forrest, the Civil War's most, was the, the Confederates' most dreaded cavalry commander, And um, backing up in in September of 1864, uh, Nathan Bedford Forrest had attacked General Sherman's Union supply lines and captured 2,300 Union soldiers, 800 horses, and wrecked the Tennessee and Alabama Railroad. In the spring of 1864, an 8,000-man Union force hunted Forrest in Tennessee, and Forrest was defeated them with 2,400 Union casualties and captured 176 supply wagons. This was the worst, considered the worst Union defeat in the West. In April of 1865, General Forrest retreated into the backwoods of Alabama near the Mississippi state line to regroup and plan his next move. At this time, Mobile and Montgomery, Alabama fell, which was further catastrophe for the South in April. The Civil War advanced the interests of women, the war gave women an opportunity to, to prove their ability and cultivate courage. 
women became independent and empowered, especially in their in nursing and nursing uh, wounded soldiers. Their, the new skills they, they got gave them confidence. Most nurses in the Confederate hospitals were slave women, African-American women. On April 17th, Mary Sur- Surratt, the owner of the boarding house in Washington, D.C., where John Wilkes Booth stayed and the conspiracy was organized, was arrested. Union General Sherman, William Tecumseh Sherman, met Confederate General Joe Johnston on April 17th, and they had uh, 10 days of negotiation. Uh, the new, when the news of President Lincoln's death came, Confederate General Johnston said, quote, Great God, terrible, the greatest possible calamity for the South. Uh, Sherman gave easy terms in his surrender, and under the original agreement, the Confederate Army was allowed to keep their weapons. He got in trouble for that. And, uh, and then later he was pressured to tell Johnston that hostilities would resume unless Johnston accepted the same terms that Grant offered Lee. In other words, all the Confederate weapons had to be uh, surrendered. On April 22nd, the war continued with skirmishes in Alabama, North Carolina, and Kansas. So as the war was coming to an end, a song was written by Thomas M. Town that went like this, quote, The vacant fireside places have waited for them long. The love light lacks their faces. The chorus waits their song. A shadowy fear has haunted the long deserted room. But now our prayers are granted. Our boys are coming home. So this is, you know, a wonderful time, really, for North and South. All the guys were going home. They were, the Union Army would be greatly reduced, and the Confederate Army was, was, was disappearing. And the men could go home to their families, their wives and children and parents and siblings. Historian William C. Davis wrote, quote, Abraham Lincoln wanted all of the Union soldiers to have that feeling of accomplishing something, for taking part in a noble, unselfish enterprise, and seeing it through to the end. That was what could give a young man the self-esteem to boost him on in life and make him a credit to himself and his community. After the surrender, uh, Robert E. Lee was depressed and sleeping late and often at his home in Richmond, Virginia. Lee determined that his public duty was that uh, he needed... Uh, that it was important for the South to take the loyalty oath to the new U.S. government. Regarding the death of Abraham Lincoln, Robert E. Lee said, called it, quote, a crime that was unexampled, one of the most deplorable that could have occurred, must be deprecated by every American. Yeah, John Wilkes Booth, before he died, you know, was in a lot of pain from breaking his leg, and he realized he really was not a, uh, a hero in the South, and so his life did not end well. Robert E. Lee in mid-April received a scout of Mosby's Rangers, a Confederate force at his home in Richmond, asking for instructions. And uh, General Lee said, quote, Go home, all you boys who fought with me. Help to build the shattered fortunes of our old state. Uh, General Robert E. Lee was determined to look ahead and not backward. Later in April, he gave an interview for, to to a reporter from the New York Herald newspaper, and he knew that people would listen, that people in the South would listen. He called the murder of uh, Abraham Lincoln a a crime, and he also said, quote, I am rejoiced that slavery is abolished. For Robert E. Lee, he he believed the South was anxious to get back into the Union and have peace, and Robert E. Lee promised, quote, to make any sacrifice or perform any honorable act that would tend to the restoration of peace. There was a story of a young man who took the loyalty oath that was asked of Southerners and was scolded by his father, and the son said that uh, Robert E. Lee had advised doing it. And the father said, quote, Oh, that alters the case. Whatever, whatever General Lee says is all right. On April 20th, uh, Robert E. Lee uh, received a letter from Jefferson Davis, or sent a letter to Jefferson Davis uh, saying that he was against the continuation of the war and uh, that he believed guerrilla war was a bad idea. Now, President, the Confederate general, President Jefferson Davis, wanted to do this, and Davis ignored Lee and pursued his, his ideas. Uh, however, the other Confederate generals uh, followed Lee's example rather than Davis. Confederate General Joe Johnston accepted uh, 
General, Union General Sherman's terms, the same that Grant had offered Lee. And uh, so this was, uh, he was disobeying his president, but following uh, the uh, example of Robert E. Lee. Uh, Robert E. Lee believed to continue the war would spread ruin in the South, and he was determined to help heal the country. So the war was over. Two countries became one again. Other Confederate generals who surrendered including Rich, included Richard Taylor, the son of former President Zachary Taylor, with his 10,000 troops in Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana. Edward Canby in Alabama on May 4th, and Nathan Bedford Forrest, uh, surrendered on May 9th. However, uh, Jefferson Davis did not surrender. He continued on the move. He, he got through Danville, Virginia, Charlotte, North Carolina, Abbott, Abbeville, South Carolina, and Irwinville, Georgia. And uh, now the one of the problems in the Civil War is that, is that the um, since the Confederate states were rebelling against the, you know, what they believe was the overly strong national government. So that's why they called themselves a confederacy, of Indi- that they were these loosely uh, aligned states. So that made it hard for them. They did not have a strong uh, national government. This was similar to the American Revolution and the challenges George Washington faced having a weak national government. Uh, Jefferson Davis was escorted by a small band of Tennessee cavalry on his travels. He was popular in South Carolina. Big crowds came to cheer him. May 3rd, he was in Georgia and wanted by the U.S. government, and on May 10th, he was captured, and this is considered really the end of the Confederate government and the end of the war. Historian David Hardin wrote, quote, Jefferson Davis's suffering or atonement secured his affection among Southerners and added the office of living martyr to his earlier positions. Yeah, Jefferson Davis was arrested, he spent time in prison, and was very poorly, very harshly treated. Eventually he was released. He was not, there was no trial, but he really suffered in, in prison. And, and uh, so this made him popular in the South. April 21st, President Lincoln's body and the body, the body of uh, their son Willie, who, Willie, who had died in uh, Washington, was loaded on a special train bound for Springfield, Illinois. He was buried at Oak Ridge Cemetery. The next 150 years, President Lincoln's casket was opened six times and moved from crypt to crypt 17 times. His funeral was on April 19th at the White House in the East Room. There were 600 mourners who came, including Ulysses S. Grant. And then the body uh, was uh, uh, traveled from the White House to the Capitol, where 100,000 mourners lined the streets. On the trip to Springfield, Illinois, there were 12 cities on the way. 30 million people saw the funeral train pass by. John Wilkes Booth was a top actor of that at that time. In 1864, his income was $20,000, twice that of Robert E. Lee. The average worker in the North made $300 a month. Now, John Wilkes Booth uh, was killed by Union t- troops on April 26 at Garrett Farm near Port Royal, Virginia. He was uh, he was in a barn that they set on fire and uh, he, anyway he was he was he was gone on May, May so he could he was not involved in the tri- eventual trial of the conspirators on which started on May 10th uh, and all they were all uh, ruled guilty and all and four all four hanged or four of them were hanged four went to the penitentiary July 6 was the execution of the uh, conspirators. Mary Surratt became the first and only woman to be hung by the U.S. government. Again, John Wilkes Booth's death was at a farmer's barn in near Bowling Green, Virginia, or also Port Royal, Virginia. When Edwin Stanton received the news that, uh, that it was possible that Booth was not dead and the person that they caught was someone else, a mistaken identity, uh, he did not want to embarrass he did not want embarrassment that they had caught the wrong guy, and he said, quote, If we let the country believe Booth is dead, well, Booth will be dead. John Wilkes Booth was buried at the Arsenal Prison in Washington, D.C. Later, his family recovered his body, and it was buried uh, with his family. Now, the trial of the, um, of the President Lincoln murder accomplishment, accomplices, the prisoners were in irons. They had irons around their legs. This is the first time this had been done since 1696. Very unjust. It was a military trial. Congressman Orville H. Browning, former 
Illinois senator and a friend of President Lincoln said, quote, This commission is without authority and its proceedings void. The execution of these persons will be murder. During the Civil War, two-thirds of the wealth of the South had disappeared. Well, this is what happens in war. South was devastated. Most railroad service was gone. There was little commerce. There were 620,000 Americans dead. One-twelfth of the population of the North died, and one-fifth of the population of the South had died, more than all other wars. At the uh, April 19th funeral, Ulysses S. Grant wept. Again, this uh, April 21, the nine-railroad car funeral train took 14 days. And in Philadelphia, the uh, President Lincoln's coffin was at Independence Hall. In New York City, there was a four-hour procession in a crowd of 85,000. They also stopped in Albany, New York. Uh, now about the end of the war, ending of the war, historian David Hardin wrote, quote, Confederate veterans returned home with diseased lungs, mangled limbs, and battlefield nightmares. David Hardin continued, quote, For many of the principal figures of the American Civil War, the years afterward would tend towards the tragic even among the victors. Often they had to draw upon the courage that had got them through the war, but less to conquer than simply endure. David Hardin continued, quote, it may be proposed that the South actually did not exist until after the Civil War. Robert E. Lee did not go to war for the South, but for his state, Virginia. And how many more thought the same way? Four years of war brought home the deep divide that had existed with the North and that had become deeper still despite a reconciliation at gunpoint. Fanning the flames as the post-war period wore on was the lack of political power of too many non-unionist whites and a scant hope of regaining it any time soon. Regarding Nathan Bedford Forrest, Richard Taylor, the son of Zachary Taylor, called him, quote, tender-hearted, kindly man. He also said, quote, I doubt if any commander since the days of lion-hearted Richard has killed as many enemies with his own hand as Forrest. David Hardin wrote, quote, General William Tecumseh Sherman would tell a West Point friend that the bitterness in the South was not, quote, manifested by the active participants, but by, quote, women and boys grown up since the war. Confederate General John Bell Hood lost his left arm and right leg at Gettys the Battles of Gettysburg and Chickamauga. David Hardin wrote, quote, John Bell Hood was a knight back from the crusade who had seen the gore and left the field to Saladin. Nice reference to the, to the Middle Ages, Saladin, a crusader in the Holy Land. David Hard, Hardin wrote about Confederate soldiers and called them knights, quote, with luck they would, you know, going back to the war, quote, with luck they would die in battle and become immortalized for their courage and tragic end. They would not be forced to survive and survey the charred landscape they had they had been helpless to prevent. They would not be left to stare into flames. David Hardin continued, quote, One of the more enduring discoveries from this post-war period is how military leaders of both sides found more comfort among their former enemies than their former comrades. See, yeah, both sides, there would be fighting amongst each other, conniving for power, and, you know, they weren't really dealing with the enemy uh, except on battle. So that, that makes sense. Now, back to President Lincoln's funeral train. It stopped in Buffalo, or when it stopped in Buffalo, New York, uh, former President Millard Fillmore was there, and also future President Grover Cleveland. In Cleveland, Ohio, the, his coffin was on Public Square for a time. 150,000 people came to see it. They stopped through Indianapolis and Chicago. By May 4th, they were in Springfield. And again, President Lincoln was buried at Oak Ridge Cemetery. May 12th and 13th at Pal Palmito Ranch, Texas, near the Rio Grande River, the last battle of the Civil War was fought. Late spring in Richmond, Virginia, at St. Paul's Episcopal Church, a black man went to the communion rail. This had never happened before. The congregation was shocked and no one moved. Robert E. Lee went to the rail and knelt next to the man and others followed. On May 22nd, there was a grand review of the armies of the Republic in Washington City. 
150,000 Union veterans were involved in a procession lasting two days. There were flags, songs, and flowers. This was to honor and respect the Union soldiers. Five of the next seven American presidents presidents were Civil War veterans, including Ulysses S. Grant, Rutherford B. Hayes, James A. Garfield, Benjamin Harrison, and William McKinley. Again, the last week of May, this farewell march, some said it was 200,000 Union soldiers. Historian Doris Kearns Goodwin wrote, quote, The soldiers marching down Pennsylvania Avenue that warm spring day knew they had accomplished something that would change their lives and their nation forever. Ulysses S. Grant said, quote, I have no doubt that Abraham Lincoln will be the conspicuous figure of the war. He was incontestably the greatest man I ever knew. Abraham Lincoln, Ulysses S. Grant, and General William Tecumseh Sherman were all, all called on the North, appealing for reconciliation, not revenge, with the South. The Civil War, was a, the Civil War experience was a ma- major contribution in American nationhood. Folks in the North and South, this became a common, a common national experience. Many folks in the South were glad slavery was ended and that the South was restored to the Union. April 1865 was one of America's finest hours, the reconciliation, North and South becoming one people, the American people, and folks in the North who wanted to, did not want to punish the South, and and then guys like Robert E. Lee who pushed for uh, reconciliation and uh, bringing the two sides back together. April 1865 also saw the end of slavery, The freed slaves, they called freemen, black Americans, African Americans, uh, gained the ability to choose where they could live, work, and how to educate their children, where and whom they could get married, uh, they could own property and not be owned. Federal officers came to tell slaves that they were free and could, could go when and where they pleased. Historian Jay Winnick wrote, quote, As flag-draped homemade coffins, he's talking about the... uh, guys who died in the war, near the end of the war, as flag-draped homemade coffins were slowly, were lowered slowly into the ground as tearful widows combed the remains of battlefields, lamps held aloft in one hand, turning over corpses to search for husbands with the other, as young wives hesitantly watched the road through their window, and as exhausted, hungry, maimed, and brooding ex-soldiers limped their way to their homes, the nation collectively strode into a new era. It continues still. Yeah, a lot of the guys walked home, well, at least from the Confederate fellows, because they didn't. there was no rail, railroads in the South that were working. For every, you, for every soldier wounded in battle, dozens of caregivers tried to repair the physical and psychological gamut, damage. And, and now, the Army nurses for the Union at the start of the war were male soldiers who were untrained and unsympathetic and not general. This, and this led to uh, uh, female volunteers who at first were unwelcome but needed, and they provided sympathy and helped the dying soldier find peace of mind. Two-thirds of the death, deaths in the Civil War were caused by disease, gangrene, typhoid, pneumonia, yellow fever, malaria, dysentery. Convalescent convalescent soldiers not yet able to return to their military duties worked as nurses in military hospitals. There were 20,000 women who worked as nurses in the war. At one Union hospital, the Mansion House Hospital in Alexandria, Virginia, the Civil War nurses uh, there, this this led to the the, the nursing profession coming into existence. Washington College in Virginia in August, offered Robert E. Lee the position as president of the college, and Lee accepted. He he, he worked at that position for the rest of his life. This was a position of honor. He worked hard. He wanted reconciliation between North and South. Robert E. Lee was against alcohol. He'd seen the effects in the Army. He was a strong Christian and believed in God's mercy and the importance of submission to God's will. Robert e, for Robert E. Lee, the Bible was the book of books. Well, that concludes today's presentation. We'll, we'll finish up the life of Abraham Lincoln next time. Uh, good luck with you. Good luck to you with your efforts in family history. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, in hi- finding, finding a good history book to read. There's so many wonderful history books out there. 
You might consider checking out our website, Adventures in History with Peter J. Ray at peterjray.com. So far, we've made 734 history videos in in eight areas, world history, American history, book reviews, poetic tours, Cleveland baseball, family history, autobiography, and Cleveland basketball. There's a donate feature. You might consider making a donation to support this work. Thanks so much for watching. I really appreciate it. God bless you. Take care, and I'll see you next time.